Welcome to the Drum Shuffle, a podcast offering insights, perspectives, and conversations for drummers. I'm your host, Jamie Eads. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to the Drum Shuffle. This is episode 37. Jamie Eads joining you as always. Hope everybody's having a great week out there. Welcome to the month of October. This month is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and I want to make sure you listen very closely to our uh, ad from Los Cabos Drumsticks this month uh, and tell you about their pink drumsticks. Uh, they do donate part of their uh, uh, profits on the pink drumsticks to cancer research. So uh, I do want to draw your attention to that for the month of October. We have a fantastic episode for you today. I am going to be joined by John Aldridge. Uh, most of you will know John uh, from his, his great engraving work. Uh, he has worked for almost every major drum manufacturer with his hand engraving. It's just fantastic. He wrote the book, uh, A Guide to Vintage Drums, uh, a few years back. It's a wonderful resource for all you vintage drum collectors. And John is also the drum tech for Brian Hitt of REO Speedwagon, and he's going to share some information about that. So please stay tuned. The best kept secret for drummers is finally out. Lost Cabos drumsticks may look like the sticks you grew up with, but these are not your father's drumsticks. Lost Cabos drumsticks is Canada's number one drumstick brand, and they are coming to a retailer near you. Los Cabos works hard to ensure they leave the world a better place than how they found it. In addition to their work with the FSC, which helps to prevent deforestation and manage environmental risks, Los Cabos Drumsticks also partners with many local and international nonprofit organizations, including Breast Cancer Can Stick It Foundation and the Canadian Cancer Society. To get involved, look for a Los Cabos pink dipped drumstick at your local music instrument retailer. With three different models to choose from and a portion of all proceeds going to support cancer research to find a cure, you might just find your new favorite drumstick. To learn more about Los Cabos drumsticks, visit them online at loscabosdrumsticks.com. Follow them on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. And don't forget to ask for Lost Cabos drumsticks at your favorite retailer. Dare to be different. Join the Red Hickory Revolution with Lost Cabos drumsticks. All right, guys and girls, as I mentioned earlier, we are joined today by just a a fantastic human being, John Aldridge, uh, who is a master engraver. uh, And I want to share a uh, just a personal aside Uh, recently I sent my Ludwig Black Beauty, uh, to John to have it engraved and he just did a fantastic, just phenomenal job on it. If you, uh, check out my Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, you will see pictures of the work he did. It, it just speaks for itself. Uh, so I was very pleased to say, John, you know, you know so much about drums and drumming. Why don't you come on the drum shuffle and and share some information with us? And he graciously agreed to do so in a break from touring with REO Speedwagon. Uh, So help me welcome to the drum shuffle, John Aldridge. Hey, good evening, John. How's it going? Well, pretty good. Just uh, sitting here in the shop. Man, are you you engraving one right now as we speak? Not at this instant. I've been working on uh, a new rack for Troy Laquetta for his next tour. Oh, cool. Well, uh, we are... Uh, aiming to get Troy on this show before too long. So he's he's one of my uh, all-time favorite drummers, so I can't wait to get him on here. He's a really nice person, but he's a really unique person in that he pretty much just says, I want to use everything in this list, put it somewhere where I can hit it. <laughs> and, and there's no real, he doesn't really, there's no restriction on where you put things and things like that. As long as he can reach it, he's happy. Well, he's a he's a monster drummer. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. Just a absolute yeah. beast of a player. 
Yeah, well, as good a player as he is, he's a better person. Well, he's, a, he's just a truly nice individual. I've heard that my entire life and can't wait to get him on this show. So uh, keep our fingers crossed. Um, John, what we typically like to do here is kind of go back to the uh, to the beginning, if you will. How did you get into drumming? The drumming? I was a little kid, you know, like everybody else. I was, uh, I had an older cousin that dated a drummer when I was about three or four, and she wound up marrying and she grew up. But uh, the uh, about the time that I noticed him, I saw a rerun of the Gene Krupa story. And that's probably right before the Beatles were on the TV. I did not see the Beatles in 64 on TV, but I saw it. Gene Krupa in 64 on TV, and that flipped my triggers. And then the Beatles, my my mom had Beatles records and things like that around, so I became aware of the Beatles really fast after I got into it. But uh, I always was in, surrounded by music. Mom and Dad sang. My dad played uh, harmonica, and uh, it was just, there was, there was always music in the house. Mom was a big fan, and she liked stuff that had good drums on it, and you know, everybody kind of knew I was going to be a drummer just because I banged on crap all the time. But I started out in, in grade school band and uh, picked up the drum set in the seventh grade and pretty much went on through high school band and college and and uh, been playing ever since. Well, you know, you, you bring up a, a really good point, And I think most people have the same kind of story is, it, you know, it's I saw somebody, I knew I wanted to do it. What is it about drummers that we all just know instantly the first time we see it that that's what we're going to do? I don't know. If you're a little enough kid and you haven't been told to behave, you'll react to whatever you hear. You know, one of the things I've done in my life is I've had several careers. One of those was as an elementary music teacher. And it was really interesting for me to see even with a kindergartner or a first grader or a second grader, which ones were just instantly in tune to rhythm and which ones got pitched really quick. And and sometimes it came along a lot later, but a lot of the little bitty kids that were going to be drummers later on were really active rhythmically as little kids, you know, or at least the ones that I witnessed. And uh, I don't know. I just think if it's in you, it's going to come out. If somebody doesn't tell you, no, put that back in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I that's think the worst. The worst part about being a kid is that nine times out of ten, it gets squished out of you before you get a chance to develop it. Especially if you're a drummer, nobody wants to listen to a young drummer. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's very true. You know, I mean, I think those of us that survive it all these years, we were fortunate that our parents gave in to it, you know, and let us do it. Yeah. So, um, yeah. well, you you know. Um, I, as a drummer, okay, I think everybody knows your work from the just the, the beautiful engraving that you've done over the years, and you've engraved for pretty much every major manufacturer that there is, um, most famously Ludwig. Um, you know, I think everybody knows all those, you know, Ludwig anniversary snares that, that you have engraved over the years, but before we get to the engraving, you know, and I've kind of heard this backstory, uh, you know, while you were a teacher, that's when you were teaching yourself to engrave. And it's because yep. you were searching for an engraved snare drum, right? Correct. I was a teacher. I didn't make a whole lot of money. Um, back in the 80s, music education was right on the cusp of being kicked out of the schools. So uh, we were kind of the bottom of the to totem pole, and I played gigs after school. I worked with a with a booking agent who had been in Tulsa since 1948, so I always had a gig with him, and it was mostly straight-ahead jazz and stuff. And I met a lot of older drummers who had really cool old drums, and uh, eventually I stumbled into vintage drums, and the few guys that I knew that collected that, everybody looked up to the Black Beauty as their holy grail. And uh, I started looking at one, and back then, it's about 81 or 82, uh, probably 83, you could buy one for maybe 600, 500 bucks, a 20s Black Beauty, a really nice one. And at that time, you know, a regular top-of-the-line snare drum wasn't going for that much, you know? Right. Uh, so it was, it was a hard sell at first. You know, I couldn't see 
that I would ever have enough money to spend six hundred dollars on a snare drum on the salary I was on then. And uh, ironically, the vintage drum hobby pretty much paid for all my snare drums. Um, I started not so modern drummer basically before I I. Uh, well, no, I guess I started Not So Modern Drummer after I started engraving. But that was where most of my engraving work came in and where I learned the most about engraving was just by looking at other people's drums that I met through Not So Modern Drummer. Sure. Well, and, you know, you said the vintage drum hobby. Um, you know, I think most people in this day and age, you know, uh, I know when I first got the vintage bug, one of my guides was your book. And it, it's the guide to vintage drums. Yeah, that's a pretty rustic book at this point. It's over 25 years old. <laughs> I still have it sitting here. I mean, it's a great book. It's a great guide. It, it's a good primer. You know, it's nowhere near complete. And, you know, the, the sad thing that I have to deal with these days is that folks who grew up with the Internet, uh, which is pretty much anyone who's 20 years old or under, looks at that book and they say, well, good gosh, I could find all this information on the internet in one hour. Well, <laughs> yes, you could. But 25 years ago, you couldn't. That's you know, the only way to get that stuff was to borrow the catalogs or, or network with guys over the phone. Yeah, that, when I first started talking back and forth to collectors, it was 36 to 60 cents a minute to talk on the phone. And we wrote a lot of, you know, pen and ink letters before we even had word processors, we were writing back and forth because we couldn't afford to call back and forth. <laughs> Those are real problems of people of, of a certain vintage, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a, the instant gratification thing just didn't work back then because if you wanted something, you'd write a letter and a week later you'd get a response. If you were lucky, maybe it was a week and a half or 10 days then you'd decide if you wanted it, and you'd send another letter, or maybe you'd just call and say, hey, I want it to keep the call short, but I'm sending you a letter with the money in it. Yeah. You know, it, was, it was really a homespun hobby. And, you know, when I first got into it, I think I had eight guys across the country that I could find. And in three or four years, it grew to 32. <laughs> 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 I mean, it just was, there were very few and far between people. Most people, if you said, I'm a drum collector, they'd look at you like you had a third third eye. It's like, why would you collect those? Right. That was the attitude back then for throughout most of the music industry. Well, and back then, it wasn't really called vintage drum collecting. It was called used drum collecting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it's it's funny, you know, I, I grew up in 1960, and I like the drums from 30 years before I was born, or 40 years before I was born. And, you know, that's a kid that's born in 2000, if he goes by that same rule, he's going to like 60s and 70s drums, which don't do a lot for me. But, you know, it's there's there's guys my age that that's what they collect. They want that 60s, 70s thing. Yeah. You know, it's a, uh, every, the great thing about collecting is that thank God everybody doesn't want the same thing, you know, otherwise everything would cost a million bucks, uh, or the stuff that I like would, you know? Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, I think it's it, with anything, it really is the, the nostalgia piece. And, you know, I mean, we mentioned Ludwig and the work that you did for them, you know, the Black Beauty wasn't a thing for many, many years until they did the reissues. And, yeah. you know, so, I mean, I think everything that's that's old is new again to certain people. No, well, sure, sure. It, it all goes around. The stuff that's popular now in 20 years, it'll fall out and then it'll come back. Yeah. But if, you, if you're a student of history, you, you look back to the turn of the last century when drums as we know them pretty much came into existence around 1892. I mean, everything that you can point to on a snare drum today existed on a snare drum in 1892. And they were, they went, they, they were even 10 lugs at that point. Then they went to 14 and 20 lugs and single tension and double tension. And, and, uh, it was, there was every possible, take on how to improve the drum just bazillions of ways to do it were explored and the, the really good ones lasted and the really silly ones didn't 
but some of those silly ones are the fun ones to collect, like the knob tension drums and things like that. But, uh, you know, drums that open like a trap door so you could put your whole kit inside the bass drum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the best thing about those bass drums like that was they offered a pad to put under the head. You know what that pad was made out of? Woven asbestos. <laughs> of course it was. <laughs> <laughs> you got to love it. Yeah, but, you know, for sure. Time, time marches on and you see how silly or how good every idea is. And, you know, fashion and, and designs certainly come and go and then come back again and go back again. You know? yeah. My kid raided my tie drawer for all my skinny ties from the 80s. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's it, it, I, I guess. It, 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 things do come full circle. And, you know, I think one of the, the cool things about the work that you do is y- you are essentially hand engraving these drums in the style that was done in the, the teens and the 20s. A- am I correct in saying that? Yeah. In fact, I'm, I'm engraving them in the style that would go back probably to the 1500s. I'm using the same tools and techniques that were around then in the, in the, in the 20th century, the early 20th century, they were looking for ways to ornament drums and they, uh, they just adapted all of the hand engraving techniques that were used on in other places like in silversmithing and in gun engraving and even trophies and things like that, uh, that carried over into musical instruments and that's where we got a lot of these engraved horns and drums but just about every company back then did some kind of engraving on one drum in their line Uh, it was that way until about 1935 and then fashions changed we were in the middle of a depression nobody wanted to waste money on something as senseless and useless as engraving all you needed was that drum to whack and uh, you needed that extra five dollars to feed the family that week so in engraving the first that I knew knew of it coming back around was in 67 when Gretsch did that gold engraved drum that they're actually reproducing the pattern of that on a new drum now using another another engraver uh, and then uh, in the late 70s Ludwig brought back a laser engraved Black Beauty but up until 89 I guess that's when I started working with Drum Heaven, DW, and Ludwig all in the same year. Uh, you know, just doing small quantities of stuff for DW and and a lot of a lot of custom companies came right on the heels of that, but mostly just you know small bits of piecework. Ludwig and Tama were really the only production. Well, DW did some production engraving too back in '99, but uh, it's it's enough to keep me busy that that I don't have to go out looking for work anymore. I mean, I keep as busy as I want to keep. Sure. And uh, I don't advertise anymore just because there's <laughs> – if I did, I'd probably get more work than I want, you know? Yeah. I have a day, I have a day job now. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we'll certainly talk about that because I think you have a pretty cool day job, um, you know, but to stay with the engraving thing – um, you know, what you're doing, not only are you doing work for, you know, these big manufacturers, but you have a, a partnership with Joyful Noise, which is a fantastic, you know, kind of all American built, handmade everything. Um, you, you know, their snare drums are just, you know, legendary. They're, they're fantastic yeah. instruments. I know you have a partnership with them. Um, and you're doing, um, vintage drum company stuff as well, where, where you're building yourself, correct? Yeah. Vintage drum company is just kind of, it, it, at, at one point I was producing six different models and you could just order one up and they all look the same. You know, your each each model looked the same from time to time, and it got to the point where I didn't really have enough time to warehouse and maintain inventory. And really, I made zilch on the drums. I just basically used them to sell my engraving. So, it uh, it if somebody wants a drum, I still have access to all of the manufacturers that made those parts for me, and I can whip you out a drum just like uh, my previous company was the Not So Modern Drum Company. And uh, 
that's where Vintage Drum Company came from. When I sold my So Modern Drummer magazine, I had to change my name. <laughs> right. So, so there's Vintage Drum Company. But mostly that's uh, – Vintage Drum Company is the heading that I use for all of the, the engraving and custom work that I do. Vintage Drum Company, my products are engraving. I can build you a custom snare drum. I can take a snare drum from another company and customize it for you. Um, I can build you a custom rack whatever you want as far as drum technical services. But uh, it's all based around in, engraving. As obviously, that's the trick that I've polished the most. Um, no. uh, right now, I'm working a lot with a little company here in Austin called A&F Drum Company. Mm-hmm. And they just kind of popped out of nowhere. But uh, they're actually producing or I'm engraving about as much for them as I am for any of the other companies that I'm doing at this point. They, uh, they just produce a lot of drums in a hurry. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it, they seem to be the, um, uh, how do I want to say this? They seem to be the it boutique shop right now. Everybody's talking yeah. about them. They're the right thing right now. You got that right there. And you know, nothing against them. They're making a product that has a real vibey, thing to it and you're going to either buy into that vibe or you're not and one thing you can't argue with is that they sound pretty dang good um and if you listen to any of their videos online you can see that it's possible to get a really super recorded sound out of it rami takes a different look at drum building than most of the custom drum builders that i know of instead of trying to build a traditional drum that follows all the rules of traditional drum building. He takes old, old techniques of making things where you weren't so concerned about that bearing edge being perfect or that shell being absolutely cylindrical. There's a little warp and a little sway in there, just like you'd find in a drum from 100 years ago. But the other thing that drives him is he's trying to produce acoustic drums that will make sounds that are very reminiscent of electronic drums. In other words, he's of the generation that grew up playing electronic drums to the point where he is, uh, what do you call that? You said the word there a few minutes ago. Um, uh, oh, God, you, now I'm on the spot. I <laughs> lo- Longing for his past, and his past includes electronic drums. Yeah like an 808 snare. He's got an acoustic drum that sounds just like a Roland 808 snare. And it's it's kind of interesting. If you don't want to play electronics, but you want access to some of those kind of white noise sounds, he's creating a lot of different ways to get those out of traditional drum designs that look really unique. I mean, I don't think anybody else is producing something that looks like it's an antique when it rolls out of the, out of the factory. Yeah, for for sure. And I mean, I think that's what draws everybody to that particular brand is, you know, I I heard somebody describe it as, you know, if if um, the steampunk movement needed a drummer, this is what he would buy, you know, (laughs) exactly that you couldn't nail it any better than that. Yeah. So um, definitely it draws your eye in. And, you know, I haven't played any other stuff personally, but um, from what I hear, it's it's good, high quality stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. Now, you you mentioned you can do pretty much anything from a drum technical service um, aspect so I want to talk a little bit about your your day gig, you know, which is actually a night gig, I guess. But um, you've been drum teching for one of our prior guests, Brian Hitt from REO Speedwagon, for how many years now? Uh, this is my 14th year with them. I, I started out to be a sub for two weeks. Uh, that's kind of a long story, but... It, if you want, I can abbreviate it. I would love to hear how you got hooked up with Brian. Well, I've known Brian for a long time. He was a subscriber to Not So Modern Drummer, and we were pals over the phone. We traded a few drums. I did some engraving for him, and we swapped some parts and stuff. So I've known him for probably 25 years. But about 15 years ago, I got cancer uh, some on my face, some skin cancer, and uh It scared me to death, even though it wasn't life-threatening or bad. They cut it out. I did radiation. It's never reappeared again. So that story ends as good. But it's, you know, when somebody says the word cancer to you, it tends to scare you a bit. Sure. 
And uh, so I reacted like most people do and said, you know, what if, what, if, what if I died tomorrow? You know, what have I not done that I really wanted to do? And, you know, I'd, I'd kind of been sitting behind a desk doing Not So Modern Drummer and engraving for the last 10 years since my kids had been born because I didn't really want to leave home and go out and play at night when that was the only time I had to be at home with them. So, um, I mean, I had done that for 10 years and I weighed about 215 pounds, which is not real pretty on a five foot six guy. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't catch my children playing baseball in the backyard and they were only, you know, five and seven, something like that. Uh, one day I told my wife I didn't want to die in the garage engraving a drum and I wanted to go out and do one more big rock show. Of course, she panicked, as any sensible woman would. She's a college <laughs> professor with a Ph.D. and has been doing that all her life. And she said, well, what are we going to do for money? And, you know, at, the, at that point, I had done enough stories about drum, and, or drum techs and had uh, associated with enough drummers and their techs to learn that it's not a, a lifestyle for the, for the weak-spirited, but it's also very rewarding monetarily. It pays well for the time that you're gone. In fact, better than just about anything else you could do if you're going to spend that much time away from home. Uh, and it's not not that physically demanding, but it did make me get up off my butt and move enough that I lost all that weight. And so after the first, you know, when, when I first started looking for a guy to work for, you know, uh, I put out the word through Todd Trent. with Ludwig. He was Ludwig's artist relations guy at the time. And he called several of his friends and let them know that I was interested. And the first guy to call was Jack Bruno, a really good friend of mine who used to play for Tina Turner and uh, uh, Joe Cocker. And he's with Delbert McClinton right now. But at the time, he was about to go out for eight months with Joe Cocker. And they were going to do Southern Asia and Europe. And it was going to be an eight-month tour with very few breaks. And at that point, I was still really heavy and wasn't sure that I could pull that off. Because I'd been a drummer all my life, but hadn't been a drum tech all my life. And believe me, there is a difference between the two. Uh, the, uh, so I think the thing that made me lose weight most was that I didn't know what a drum tech really did in an, in an organization like REO Speedwagon. And after I turned Jack down, like the next day, um, Brian called and he says, look, I can't hire you because you live in Oklahoma, and but I need a guy because the guy that I've got is just not working out. We're not clicking. He's too young to relate to me, and I'm too old to relate to him, and he's just dropping the ball a bunch of times. So, so he says, can you come out for two weeks and cover? And I thought, well, that'd be great. And then I can see if I can actually do it before I'm committed and, and they're stuck with me. And uh, so I went out and did my two weeks, and, and boy, was it an eye-opening experience. I lost a good 20 pounds in those two weeks. Oh, my God. It was, it was ridiculous. It was the hottest sweater, hottest summer on record for, for them for the longest time, and we were just going right down through the middle of the heat belt. And uh, and since I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing, about half the time I was having to run to catch up doing it. So I was I was really putting out and it and it just sweated right on off of me. Well, when I came back home after just two weeks, I could catch the kids running around the backyard, and it was enough that they noticed. Wow, Dad, where did your newfound speed come from? <laughs> <laughs> and at, at the end of the two weeks, I told Brian, or, you know, asked him if he wanted me to show his new guy from California what to do because you know the original story was well. I need to find somebody from California because every time we rehearse, we'd have to fly you out there to set things up, which, okay. Um, I made the mistake of saying, well, what? You mean you can't even set your drums up for a rehearsal? Oh. <laughs> Brian, Brian just laughed at me because, no, it's not that I can't. It's just that I don't want to. Right. <laughs> so anyway, at the end of the two weeks, I offered to you know train the other guy, and he says, why, don't you like it? And I says, yeah, I like it, but you said you couldn't hire me from Oklahoma, with me living in Oklahoma. And he says, well, we really didn't think you were going to be able to pull it off, <laughs> so we just wanted to let you down easy if you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so he had brought me out there, and he had conned the band into bringing me out as a, as a never-before-toured tech, and uh, 
and I have to really thank him for that. He put a lot of faith in me, and and uh, and the rest of the crew really showed me how to be a, a crew guy and a tech. Because these guys that they have working with them, all of them have a lot of experience. I mean, there's probably a hundred years of teching experience on that crew, and and they worked with the best names in the business before they ever got to REO Speedwagon. It's a it's a unique gig, and then it goes year round. We're never out longer than four or five weeks at a time, and even that's only once or twice a year. The rest of the time, we're out anywhere from three days to ten days and, you know, a couple of weeks off in between. So it's a really good gig. It allows me time all year long to engrave in between runs, and it also keeps the money coming all year long. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, Brian's nothing, has just nothing but a nice guy. I mean, that's just all there is to it, and a great drummer as well, just yes. a fantastic player. Now, um, I, you know, you and I talked a few weeks ago, and, and I'm going to, uh, to to give my personal experience with a John Aldridge engraved drum. You know, I, I lost my mom back in August, and one of the things that I wanted to do was have, um, you know, my Black Beauty engraved as a tribute to her. And, I, you know, I called you up, I sent you the shell, and I said, John, I want a scroll pattern, do something nice for my mom said i want my you know her name on there and i have to say it is just beyond my wildest imagination beautiful uh you just did such a fantastic job on the drum it's just it just absolutely gorgeous so thank you for doing that um thank you thank you very much oh you're welcome and and, you know if anybody has ever thought about doing it and wondered is it worth it uh i'm here to tell you it is absolutely worth it and uh just a fantastic job but i say all of that to get to you know when we were on the phone talking you know i said well we've had brian on the show i'd love to have you on the show to talk about what you do as well and you know we were kind of talking about you know, a day in the life of you as Brian's drum tech. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I think I've been asked the question a lot. Well, what does a drum tech really do? And you alluded to it. You said, I didn't even really know, even though I've been a drummer my whole life, I didn't really know what a drum tech did. What is it? What is a typical day like? Well, it, it kind of depends on the show. Most like for a routed tour, like I'm about to head out Wednesday for, 10, 11 days on the road. We're going to do eight shows in those 11 days. Um, or no, it's 14 days, eight shows in 14 days. Anyway, I'll, we fly to wherever the tour is going to start. In this case, it's in uh, Hartford, Connecticut. Stay at a hotel at night, get up the next morning, get on a bus, a charter bus, or that uh, the band charters one bus for them, and they charter one bus for the crew. Uh, ride the bus to the venue, get off the bus, have some catering and breakfast, and uh, start. Uh, I have two jobs with REO, well, three jobs really. I do the dressing rooms first, then I set up the drums, and then during the show, I run the, the click track and the samplers and stuff that are behind Brian that uh, to help him do his thing. And I'm also on stage there, kind of out of sight, so that if he needs something fixed with his monitors i'm there to run to the monitor desk and get it fixed um but anyway back to breakfast as soon as breakfast's over i go to the dressing room scope them out and uh, try to figure out how our cases are going to fit in there we have two dressing rooms one for kevin and one for the band uh, mostly because nobody wants to hear kevin sing and kevin doesn't want (laughs) to sing around anybody before the show (laughs) that's so Uh, funny but i try to set up their world as similar from day to day as it's possible to do with the space that I'm given. And uh, basically I've got four gigantic wardrobe cases that all open up and make walls inside of the dressing room. And uh, I set up a practice drum kit, three amps, three guitar stands. The guitar techs come down and bring the guitar stands or guitars to the dressing room for the guys to play. But I have one case that has three amps, you know, two lead, two guitar amps and one bass amp in it. And that just goes to the dressing room cases or along with the four dressing room cases. Brian's got a little practice kit with a double pedal and a, a practice pad. And uh, 
Once that's set up, I go upstairs, and by that time, the uh, the stage manager has usually got the risers built, and my cases are lined up behind it. And uh, so I'll vacuum my riser. We have the REO speed vacuum. <laughs> Pull that off the truck and vacuum my riser because all the carpet's black, and Brian is basically a woodchuck every night. He he puts out enough sawdust to make that thing look like it's snowed on it. So <laughs> vacuuming is a big part of the, the morning. Then I set up the rack, uh, and as I take the head, the drums out of the cases to put them on the rack, if I'm going to change heads, I'll do it then uh, if I've got time. If it looks like we're tight, like if we're going to, for the closer and there's four or five bands on stage earlier, I'll go ahead and build the whole kit. And after we've done line check and, and pushed back out of the way of the other bands that need to get to the stage, I'll go ahead and change the heads then so it doesn't hold up our line check. Once I've set up and tuned the drums and the cymbals, um, then we do a line check, which means we test every line that's going to the drum set and every other instrument. But it's a very orderly process. The monitor engineer runs it. He starts out by testing the vocal mics, then we test the drums, bass drum, all the way up to the cymbals, the sampler, and then the click track, and um, and then after everyone on stage, every tech has gone through their guitars, all three of their wireless boxes, everything gets tested that's going to get used during the show, and that's just to make sure a signal's going down. It. It's not a sound check at that point. After it's all, we're sure it's all working, and then the whole crew gets out there and plays anywhere from two to four songs that we play every day. So the front of house engineer knows exactly what we should sound like, and he, he uh, mixes us to sound like we should sound like, and then he knows that when the band comes up there, that's how the PA was set before, that's how they're going to sound. Gotcha. So we do, we do all the sound checks for the band. Really, the only time that they do a sound check is if they're going to come in and practice something or rehearse something or make a change in the show that they need to polish themselves, then they'll do a sound check. But nine times out of ten, they just, they'd rather come right before the show and do their thing. Basically, a drum tech makes it so that Brian can walk in, sit down at the drum set, and start playing, and then get up and walk away. And the drum set magically appears and is perfectly set up every day, and it's cleaned and spit and polished. And then it, it shows up the next day magically looking the same. After the show, as soon as they finish and walk off the deck, I tear it down, put it in the boxes, and I tear down everything. The rack comes completely apart. It takes me about 15 minutes to get the whole thing down and in the cases. And uh, then I go to the dressing rooms take all their dirty clothes, put them on a clothing rack to be either air-dried for the next day or taken to a dry cleaner's the next morning. And uh, put those dirty clothes on the bus so I can get to them first thing in the morning before the trucks open. And then uh, go take a shower and go to the bus and go to bed. Wake up in the parking lot of the next gig the next morning. Wash, rinse, repeat. Yeah, so so it's a real exciting life, in other words. Oh, thrilling. Thrilling. <laughs> well, you know. Well, i tell you what, if it gets thrilling, it's not exciting, because really the excitement comes when something goes horribly awry in the middle of a show. Exactly. And yes, it can be terribly exciting, but it's also, you know, I get nervous every time I have to push a button that goes along with the band, because if I don't push the right button and something horrible goes wrong, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I mean, for anybody that's seen an REO show, uh, it, they are a well-oiled machine. They just put on a great show and and just, you know, fantastic players all the way around, you know. And, and Brian and I, when we had him on the show, you know, we, we talked about... Um, you know, Dave Amato, the guitarist. And a lot of people don't know it, but all of that, you know, Bon Jovi, Aerosmith, Motley Crue stuff from the late 80s and early 90s, he was kind of their studio secret weapon. He did all those high harmonies with all those bands yeah. for years. Yeah, um, if you would see the, the Motley Crue, the last tour, if you heard the high harmonies singing on their tracks that were playing along with them, that was still Dave Amato in their live show running as a track. 
Yeah, of course it was. I mean, you know, he's just such a... But all the guys in REO are just fantastic players, singers, just great musicians. And and it's a heck of a show. Yeah. But what I think is so yes, cool... The part of that, besides being fantastic musicians, is that you, you'll never see a group of people put as much effort out when they walk out there. I mean, Brian comes off the deck ringing wet. Bruce, he walks into the shower with his clothes on because they're so sweaty he wants to rinse the salt out of them. I mean, <laughs> that's how hard these guys are working. Their pants and clothes are horrid after the show. And it's every single one of them, except for Neil Doughty, who's the keyboard player. And obviously, he doesn't have a lot of gut-wrenching gut movements to make to play the keyboard. Right, right. Well, <laughs> Which, uh, I, 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 but I think what is so cool about having you walk through a day in the life is, you know, it's the stuff that nobody ever sees, so they don't appreciate it. You know, and, yeah. uh, unless you've been out on the road and you understand what a, an orchestration it is to put on that show, you don't have an appreciation for it. Yeah. You know, the one thing that I glossed over there is that after we finish doing our line check and if we're leaving the stuff on stage... Sometimes we're leaving that stuff on stage for 12 hours before we come back to it. Yeah. And that means that there's five other bands playing, setting up, doing their line check, their sound check, then pushing back in another band, setting up and line checking before them. Or sometimes it's all day long there, there are bands being wheeled onto the deck in front of us and off while another band comes on. So there's... Most of the time, once it's once we've finished our line check, we either push our stuff to the back of the deck and cover it up, and we don't come back out on deck, and unless I need to change heads or clean cymbals, until showtime. So there's a lot of dead time at some shows, and then some shows you get there late, you set up, you have just enough time to line check, sound check, and then it's time for the show, the doors to open, you know. Thankfully, that doesn't happen very often. We have a lot of time, and, and, and our, our production manager is just a nervous enough guy that he makes sure we're there early for everything. Yeah. Well, now, on those days that you have just hours and hours after your work is done before showtime, do you guys still go out and, and play golf? I know that was like one of the traditions for REO Speedwagon was there was a lot of golf that went on. Well, the band plays a lot of golf, but I no, the crew doesn't. We rarely even leave the venue unless, unless it's just to go to a restaurant nearby and eat. Uh, one of the techs, Smooth and Paul, they'll go out and get coffee in, during the day. But for the most part, all of the wandering, not wandering around stuff for the crew happens on days off. I got gotcha. you. Know, unless our venue just happens to be in the middle of a big city. Like two weeks ago, we were in Denver for one show. And it was in a park in the middle of downtown. So after we set up and pushed our stuff to the back of the deck, I had, like I said, eight hours to walk around Denver. So I did. Yeah. I walked all over the place. And you know, I li used to live in Boulder, so I had friends that lived there that came to visit during the day. Uh, you know, that big wide spirit spot in the day is, is the best time for me to have company. Having company during a show is absolutely the worst thing for me. <laughs> uh, of course it I, is. I, I really don't like having guests uh, on on the deck. Uh, sometimes it's a, it's a friend of Brian's, and and they don't really feel comfortable in the audience or something like that. So those guys are on the deck, but it's that's just another person for me to watch out for during the show. Yeah. You know, a lot of times something happens, like if if a pedal breaks or uh, the snare bottom snare head breaks or the snares break or a cymbal breaks. I'll come hauling, hauling it off the stage pretty fast. And if there's a bunch of people standing on the side, it's not real easy to get to where I need to go to get the replacement parts to fix things before the next song starts, you know? Right. It's the, when things go wrong, they really do get your heart rate up because it has to be fixed right then. You don't have the luxury of just saying, Oh, don't hit that. <laughs> R r exactly exactly well and what do you mean you got five symbols you don't need that 19 in the very front <laughs> <laughs> yeah well us drummers we tend to be very particular about our gear now you know one of the things that that um that you and i discussed kind of offline if you will was the fact that brian is a very hard hitter um and, and you were telling me that you're changing 
drum heads pretty much either every show or every other show. Right. If it's if it's a big uh, arena gig and and the crowd's huge and everyone's amped up, Brian gets amped up and a little bit harder hitting that. If, if it's a show like that, yeah, I got to change all the tom heads afterwards because he will dish out everything. But usually on you know theater shows and and uh, the the venues where we're playing for four or five thousand people, it's it's a very precise, very controlled performance and. Uh, you know, it's I can get two shows out of a set of tom heads. I can get two shows out of a snare head, bass drum heads. I don't usually change those except for like every six months. I'll change the back head on the bass drum, uh, bottom heads on the snare drum. I'll change those every other time that I change the top head, or well, maybe every third or fourth time, I guess. But the he hits really, really hard, and the snares actually chew through the bottom head. That's what causes them to break, because it's. I don't know if you've ever watched the bottom of a snare drum when somebody's playing it. Yeah. But if depending on how hard they hit, those snares can come off the off the thing about a half an inch. Yeah, and before slap. They slap back up against it. Yeah. And uh, and if there's uh, if they're textured like the carbon wires on Pure Sounds are, they'll actually indent the head and chew it up as it does that. So that's why I have to change the bottom head so often. Symbols, he cracks quite a few of them. You know, he's not as bad as he was when I first started with him. Uh, he, as he's gotten uh, gotten a few years older, he's kind of started looking at how can he hit the symbol so it doesn't hurt him so much, too. Right. Uh, and he's, I have to say, he's, he's as, as a maturing drummer, he, he just keeps getting better in the way that his technique goes and the way that he, he chooses to hit things. I'd still like for him to hit things just a little lighter, but that's just because I hate fixing broken stuff <laughs> and I hate broken cymbals. Uh, yeah. We, he's using a fairly light cymbal now, too, so that's a credit to him that he's not breaking so many these days. It's He's using these K-Custom hybrids, which are really musical-sounding cymbals. And, uh, but the, if, if they, they actually tend to get beaten out of tune before they break. Yeah. Uh, in other words, they'll they'll kind of go dead. Right. And you won't be able to find a crack or a dent or a chip or anything in them. They've just been played too long. And usually that's like six months of really steady gigs will do that to a cymbal. But occasionally he'll just reach over and whack it, and it just cracks. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, well... I- <laughs> He's a very powerful player. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Well, it, it, he is a great drummer. Now, I, when you're not on the road with REO and you're not in the shop engraving drums and building stuff for people, do you gig yourself at all anymore? Not much. Uh, Jimmy Emerson, the bass and keyboard tech with REO, and I do a little bit of recording of songs that he writes. And uh, so I've done a, a, a little bit of recording here, and I sub for a guy on a gig here. But really, I don't have enough time or predictability in my schedule to to work with bands locally. And also, it really is it's like I, I, I'm old, and I don't really want to schlep my gigs downtown, <laughs> my, my gear downtown for that, and play for, you know, 50 bucks a night. I was doing that in the 70s. You know, if it paid a little more, you know, like everything else, uh, I would probably still go out and push it. But uh, I, if I ever get rid of the REO gig, I'll probably play again. But at this point, I, I have a practice rig here at my house. I play every day on that. I play every day on Brian's kit when I'm on the road. So I'm still playing a lot. My chops are still in fairly good shape, although they're whatever they are, they're not that great. But but they're there still. <laughs> I can get through a gig. Yeah. Well, I, and, you know, what I think is so great about it is, you, you know, I, you are such an artisan when it comes to the, the, the engraving stuff. And, and, you know, I wish we had spent, you know, the whole, you know, 45, 50 minutes that we had talking about that. But I think it's amazing that you went from being an elementary school teacher to making your living around the instrument you love. Yeah, it's I think that's, you know, one of the things that makes me happiest about where I've wound up is that, you know, it's not anywhere I plan to be. 
it, everything that I do today grew out of something I was doing before, and it, it was a very natural progression. You know, I got a degree in, in education, which is why I started teaching. But it was once the engraving started making more than teaching, and teaching became a real headache because of the political correctness of everything that I, uh, was going on at the time. In the late 90s or early 90s, I was living in Boulder, Colorado, and it was painfully politically correct. And and I grew up in Oklahoma and kind of a hick. And so, you know, it, it took me a long time to realize that the, the whole rest of the world was out there. And at that point, it hadn't dawned on me yet. But I was beginning to figure out that there was a wider world than what I had seen. The thing that really opened my eyes to, to where my place is in life is touring around and seeing how other people live. And you know, I'm very, very grateful for what I have and what I've been able to do. Because, you know, I, I see a lot of people going and doing a job they don't like. And they got to do it every day because they got to make the money because they got to pay the bills. And every day I go and do something that I chose to do for fun before somebody started paying me for it. You know, and that that to me is is priceless. Yeah, we we should all be so fortunate. Um, John, one of the traditions that we have here on the drum shuffle is we always ask our our guests for a good piece of advice. Um, you know, I, I, you may have just given us the good piece of advice, and that is to be grateful. I don't know, but um, you've just had an amazing career in and around the drums. Tell us what you've learned over your amazing career. Well, I learned that if you're interested in something enough, and I mean really interested in it, it's something you want to do, you will find a way to do it. And if you could do it, you'll be good at it because you're interested enough to find a way to do it. If you do it and you keep doing it, you'll get really good at it and other people will want you to do it for them. And it really doesn't matter what it is. You could be a wood burner, you could be a painter, uh, a carver, a, a woodworker who works in the shop and does bearing edges, anything that you want to do in just about any field. If you truly want to do it, then you're going to put everything you've got into doing it, and you're going to do it in a way that, that has some meaning. It's, you're, you care about it. It's a product of your desire to build something or, or produce something that is your voice. And as long as you're pursuing that particular channel, you may be successful, you may not, but monetarily. But you'll always be successful in that you're doing what you chose to do in the way that you chose to do it. You know, granted, everybody has to make a living somehow. And I, I made my living until I figured out a way to make my living doing what I wanted to. And sometimes figuring out what you want to do is the hardest question, you know. I know a lot of people that are really intelligent people, but they haven't figured out what it is that trips their triggers, what they'd be happy doing even if nobody paid them. And uh, that's kind of the way I look at my job. Would I still engrave if it wasn't a paying gig? Yeah, probably. Not as much, but I would. Would I still play drums if nobody paid me? Well, yes, I do it every day. Uh, would I still drum tech? Mm, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's, a job. it's a job, but it's a hard job. But you get you really get paid as a tech to stay away from home. Yeah, that's what that's what your money is for. The job itself, I mean, I get a tremendous amount of satisfaction of producing a, a good sound out of the drums, making sure they look sharp. I mean, I like to show off Brian's kit and say, "Looky here, looky here." Those things make me happy. Yeah, but, for uh, sure. That's a long-winded answer for find out what you like first, then go do it. Oh, I think it's great advice, John. I mean, it's just fantastic. Um, John, if somebody out there listening today has a has a drum sitting around that they want to send your way, is uh, social media the best way to find you and make contact? That's probably the easiest way, just because Facebook is so easy to find and Instagram is so easy to find. I'm on both of those platforms, and I'm very approachable. Uh, try them both, and uh, you know, if you if you can't reach me either way, if you can remember drumscratcher at gmail dot com, that's another way to reach me. 
Fantastic. Well, we're going to send some folks your way because I can attest your work is just simply breathtaking. Uh, John, thank you so much for your time tonight. You're welcome here anytime. Keep us posted, okay? You betcha. Have a great night. All right. Thanks, John. Okay, everybody, that's going to do it for episode 37 of the Drum Shuffle. As always, go ahead and hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you're using to listen in today. It helps us tremendously to continue our growth. Uh, We certainly do appreciate each and every one of you tuning in week after week. We cannot do what we do here without every single one of you. We love hearing from you throughout the week. Our email address is the drum shuffle podcast at gmail.com. Our web address is the drum and you can find more information on me over at Jamie You are not going to want to miss some of the guests that we have coming up over the next few weeks. Uh, we're going to be joined here pretty soon by April Samuels. April is the CEO and founder of the breast cancer cancer can stick it foundation. Uh, and if you listened into that lost cabos ad earlier in the episode, you know that that's one of the cancer charities that their pink drumsticks support. Uh, this is breast cancer awareness month. So we are pleased to put a spotlight on April, just a phenomenal, phenomenal drummer and her story is so inspirational can't wait to bring you that episode so make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss that again thank you so much for tuning in we certainly appreciate it keep your emails coming we love hearing from you until next time may your head stay strong and your sticks never break cheers